Hi everyone, here we're going to be talking about the structure of the Earth. So uh, you will be able to classify different layers of the Earth, both by strength and by composition, as well as calculate the density of certain objects using uh, volume measurements, and then also think about how density uh, relates different types of rocks to different layers of the Earth. So. Let's remember the three main layers of our Earth. We have the crust, the mantle, and the core. The core is at the center. The crust is the outermost layer where we live. And uh, each of the layers has a different proportion of those four main elements that we have on Earth. So let's talk about the different layers um, from the inside out. So there is the inner core and the outer core that makes up our core. We separate them because they are slightly different. So the inner core is a solid. It's about the size of the moon, but it is the temperature of the sun. Very, very, very hot. It is uh, the densest portion of our Earth. So it's about 90% of its weight is due to iron. The outer core is actually liquid. So the outer core is a liquid and it is responsible for our magnetic field. So the magnetic field we have around Earth is due to the fact that we have a motion of material because the outer core is actually a liquid. So here I have uh, the core is the most dense. The outer core is that liquid. It is made of a combination of iron, nickel, and sulfur for the most part. Um, and it is about uh, 2,200 kilometers thick. The solid inner core, the big difference is that it is solid. Um, it's a bit smaller density-wise, It's uh, excuse me, radius-wise, it's about the size of the moon. So together, the inner core and the outer core make up the most dense part of our Earth, which is what we call the core. So the next layer up is the mantle. So this is a solid rock layer, so the mantle is solid. It is between the core and the crust, so it's in the middle. So there's a lot more iron in our mantle, which is a very heavy material, than there is in our crust. Um, so the mantle is much more dense than our crust. It's about uh, 3,000 kilometers thick, and the mantle actually makes up about 82% of Earth's volume. So the majority of Earth's volume is in the mantle. And below about 100, 150 kilometers, the rock in the mantle, so the mantle material, is hot enough that it actually flows. So it's malleable. It's still a solid, but it can move. So think of a plastic. If you were to put a plastic Tupperware in the microwave for long enough, uh, it's going to melt. It's going to change shape. It's Don't touch it, but if you had gloves on, you could mold it into a different shape even though it is still a solid material. Your plastic didn't turn into a liquid. That's exactly what the mantle is like. So it's hot, it's so hot, there's so much pressure that it can actually flow, it can actually move, but it is still a solid. It is not um, a liquid material. So the mantle here in this diagram, the simplified diagram, it is uh, the solid rock layer that makes up the majority of Earth's volume, but uh, Beneath about 100 kilometers, it is uh, hot enough that it can actually flow. So that is important, the fact that it flows, uh, when we get to talking about the crust. So when we talk about the crust, the outermost, least dense portion of our Earth, there are two different types. So we have what we call continental crust and what we call oceanic crust. So continental crust is uh, granitic. It is made up of a significant amount of granite, and it has a very high silica content, which means it is felsic. We are going to go over felsic and mafic quite a bit when we get into rocks and minerals, so I'm just introducing these terms now. Uh, the oceanic crust, uh, basaltic, it is a much higher iron and magnesium content. This is called mafic. Oceanic crust is much more dense. So you see here uh, the density is uh, much higher in oceanic crust than it is in continental crust. 
but the continental crust can be quite thick, so it can vary between 30 and 70 kilometers, whereas oceanic crust is 6 to 7 kilometers pretty much consistently. It's very uniform. So we have here a diagram showing this uh, pinkish beige is showing continental crust, and our oceanic crust is this very thin, dark gray color. So notice that in this diagram, the oceanic crust is about the same thickness throughout, um, and it is much thinner than our continental crust, which has a very variable thickness. So the crust is the outermost layer, so the outermost skin of the Earth, um, and it has the thickest mountain ranges. So where our crust is the thickest is where we have mountain ranges, and where it is uh, the thinnest is at what we call mid-ocean ridges, which would be something like right here. So this would be our uh, part of our oceanic crust where we have the very thin areas, um, the thickest areas of crust is going to be our continental crust where we have mountain ranges. So our continental crust is named continental crust because it underlies our continents. So our continents are made up of continental crust. It is less dense than oceanic crust and much thicker. Oceanic crust, you can imagine, is named because it underlies oceans. So oceanic crust is where we have our oceans. It's more dense and much less thick than our continental crust. So here's another diagram. We see our continental crust in beige. Here's our mantle. And then we have the oceanic crust, and it is underwater. So that blue is the sea level. That is um, our ocean. So the oceanic crust is um, so thin and deep that it actually is where we have our oceans. So we're going to get into the differences of uh, oceanic and continental crust when we start talking about plate tectonics next week. That will become very, very important. So the next thing to think about is what we call geothermal heat. So I talked about how the inner core is about the temperature of our sun. It is very, 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 very hot. Um, we know that standing on the surface of the Earth, we are not at the temperature of the sun. There's much more heat in the center of the Earth than there is on the surface. So the best way to think about geothermal heat, or a good way to think about geothermal heat, is to think about um, the beach. So if you're walking on the beach, you take off your shoes and you walk. It's a very, very hot, very, very sunny day. You're walking on the beach. Generally, you're either going to want to run to a towel or to some wet sand or throw your flip-flops back on because you might be burning the bottoms of your feet. So the sand can get very, very, very hot at the beach. Now, if you dig down just a few inches, which my dog does every single time we go to the beach, you notice that just a few inches beneath the surface, the sand is going to be much cooler. So my dog, every time we go to the beach, he will actually sit underneath our beach chairs and dig under the beach chairs. And about every 20 minutes, he gets up to dig a little deeper because the surface gets too hot, digs a little bit more so he can lay in the cooler sand. So if you're sitting on at your beach chair, sitting at your beach towel, and your feet are getting too hot, kind of bury them under the sand, get to the cooler sand. So what we see here is that the surface sand is very, very, very hot, or can be very, very, very hot. However, a few inches below, it can actually be really nice and cool. So what that is explaining or showing us is that the sun heats the sand on the surface of the earth, yes, but that heat does not penetrate very much into the earth, no more than an inch or two. Otherwise, as we dug down, it would still be warm. So this, the heat from the, uh, the sun does heat the surface of the earth, but it doesn't heat anywhere beneath the surface of the earth. That heat from the sun cannot penetrate to any uh, depth in the earth's crust. So that leads us to the next question. What is causing the melting of the rock within earth? Would it be the sun's energy 
or would it be Earth's internal energy? Well, we just talked about how we know that the sun, the heat from the sun can't penetrate very far into the crust, more than an inch or two. So we know that any melting of rock within Earth cannot be caused by the sun. It's actually caused by energy that's already within the center of the Earth. So Earth's internal energy is causing um, any sort of melting that occurs within Earth. So why is center of the Earth hot? Okay, the core is the temperature of the sun. Why is that? It's a combination of a few things. So both kinetic and gravitational energy can convert to thermal energy. Thermal energy being um, heat that you can feel. So there's energy left over from when the planet formed, as well as energy left over from when the planet was very, very young and was bombarded by asteroids and comets. So there was a lot of collision as the Earth was forming, as it was, as I said, clearing its neighborhood of other um, objects. There was a lot of energy stored in the Earth. So that can be converted, is converted to thermal energy or heat, um, as well as radioactivity. So decay of certain isotopes, decay of certain elements within the Earth produces heat. So there's quite a bit of thermal energy within the Earth, and it wants to escape. So the core and all of the heat within the core of the Earth is actually what's responsible for all processes associated with what we call plate tectonics. So any, um, all of the melting of Earth, all of the motion of the continents and the ocean on the surface of the, of the Earth, it's actually fueled by the massive amount of thermal energy that's trying to escape from the center of our Earth, from our core. So we can also think about what's called the geothermal gradient. So the geothermal gradient is the rate of change with uh, the rate of change of temperature with depth. So as you dig downwards, how much warmer is it going to get, say, per kilometer? So the average is about uh, 25 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So if you dig down one kilometer, on average, uh, the temperature will be about 25 degrees warmer than it was at the surface. So imagine uh, the deepest mine that we have on Earth is almost four kilometers deep. It is very hot down there. Um, that is a gold mine in South Africa. So here is actually a picture of it. So we will get to mining and uh, resources on Earth, such as uh, gold and other things we mine for. Um, towards the middle of this class. We'll have a whole component on that. So as a review, we have uh, different layers of the earth, the crust, the mantle, and the core. And that outer core, the liquid, um, the liquid outer core is what causes our magnetic field. So this liquid material, there's going to be convection and motion going on in our outer core, shown here by the uh, yellow. The inner core is this purplish white, and then our mantle is shown by the red. So the fact that there's convection going on, because the inner core is so incredibly hot, there's convection going on in our outer core, that is actually what's causing our magnetic field. So the magnetic field, we have our magnetic field lines here going from the south magnetic pole to the north magnetic pole, all caused by the outer core in that it is a liquid. So our magnetic field is very similar, honestly, to a bar magnet. So there's a positive end and a negative end. We have a north and a south. So here we have um, our uh, north and our south here. So we have our magnetic field lines. They go from the south to the north in our current um, situation now. So it's very, very similar as a bar magnet, as if we had a bar magnet through the center of our Earth. Um, it is not perfectly lined up to north and south geographic poles, but it's fairly similar. That is why our compasses work. So the magnetic field, um, it's, it's very cool actually because it protects us quite a bit from what would otherwise be very, very dangerous. So solar wind uh, from the sun and cosmic rays, both made up of 
very, very, very high energy protons and electrons, so very high energy particles that if they did reach the surface of the Earth would be hugely damaging. But the fact that we have this magnetic field, it actually blocks us or protects us from these high energy particles. But what also happens is these high energy particles in the solar wind, instead of having a perfectly circular magnetic field, such as in this cartoon, uh, the solar wind actually blows our magnetic field out into sort of a teardrop shape. So it's actually blown out and away from the sun. So that we call our uh, magnetosphere. So uh, the magnetic field, it's not a perfect circle. It's not symmetrical. It's actually blown outwards um, away from the sun. But it does protect us from some very, very high energy and potentially really dangerous particles. So our Earth, my personal favorite planet, we have a hydrosphere that has both solid, liquid, and gas. So we have ice, we have liquid water, and we have water vapor. Our Earth is sort of in the Goldilocks zone, as they call it. Um, it is not too hot or too cold, so we are able to have all three states of water on our planet at the same time. We also have a magnetic field that shields us from the most harmful rays and radiation from the sun. We have a very oxygen rich atmosphere, which allows for life, including our own. And we have uh, life on earth and a huge diversity of life on earth. So when we think about uh, the layers of our wonderful earth, uh, when we think about composition, so if we break our earth up into layers based on what those layers are made of, that's what we've been going over so far. So the egg analogy, we have our crust, our mantle, and our core. So the inner core and the outer core. Uh, outer core is liquid. Inner core, the very, very center, is solid. But we can also think about our layers in a different way. So we can think about the layers by strength of material. So here we have our layers by composition, our core, our mantle, our crust. When we think about our layers by strength or the mechanical layers, we actually split it differently. So here we have the, um, the inner core, the outer core, the mesosphere, the asthenosphere, and then the lithosphere. So the lithosphere um, holds the crust. Then we have the asthenosphere and the mesosphere, which are sort of the mantle. And then the outer core and the inner core, which make up the core. So here is a nice graphic that actually shows um, both sides. So here we have our layers by strength. And here we have our layers by um, composition. So by composition, what is it made of? Uh, the core, where we have the very most dense materials, the crust where we have the least dense, and then we have um, by strength. So there are some other differences between these layers. We have the lithosphere, um, our crust, our very um, topmost layer, the asthenosphere, the mesosphere, the outer core, and the inner core. So these are going to be more important when we start talking next week about um, plate tectonics. We're going to get more into these layers. So as a review for this section, we remember that the Earth has layers because it went through differentiation. So as the Earth was forming, it was all molten. As it began to cool, uh, the most dense materials fell to the center. So the very center of the earth is made up of the very most dense material. That is why our core is the very most dense. Our crust is the least dense. So we can think about the layers of our earth either by uh, composition, so what are they made of uh, chemically, or by strength, so the different strengths of um, uh, the layers, so the lithosphere, the asthenosphere, and the mesosphere make up uh, the crust and the upper mantle, which um, we will learn a lot more about the differences here and why those are important starting next week when we get into uh, plate tectonics. 
So I will leave it at that for this week. Hope you enjoyed the first week of lectures, and uh, I'll see you back here next week.